When I grew up, my parents had a small gift shop and there was a little sign up there. It had trinkets and it said, if you break it, it's yours. And, and I often say that that's the case with, with our world in some sense. The first world, the United States and Europe uh, have, have dump, been dumping carbon in the atmosphere for 100 years. And, and the impacts, will, the worst impacts, the most immediate impacts will happen in parts of the world that really didn't contribute to that. So we kind of have at least an ethical, I don't know whether I use the word moral, but an ethical obligation, I think, to, to reach out and assist because we've helped create the problem. Professor Lawrence Krauss is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Lawrence is an internationally known theoretical physicist and best-selling author, as well as being an acclaimed lecturer. He is currently president of the Origins Project Foundation, newly founded, which celebrates science and culture by connecting scientists, artists, writers, and celebrities with the public through special events, online discussions, and unique travel opportunities. The foundation produces the Origins podcast, a video podcast he hosts involving dialogues with the most interesting people in the world, discussing issues that address the global challenges of the 21st century. His own research interests have focused on the interface between elementary particle physics and cosmology, including origin and evolution of the universe and the fundamental structure of matter. Among his numerous important scientific contributions was the proposal in 1995 that most of the energy of the universe resides in empty spaces. Before taking his current position, Krauss served as director of Arizona State University's Origins Project, a national center for research and outreach on origins issues, and as foundation professor at ASU from 2008 to 2018. He's held many, many different positions. One that I personally really love is the chair of the board of sponsors of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists from 2008 to 2018. During his career, Professor Krauss has held endowed professorship and distinguished research appointments at many, many institutions, including Harvard University, Yale, University of Chicago, Boston University, University of Zurich, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, the European Center for Nuclear Research, CERN, Case Western Reserve University, Australian National University, and you're getting the point here, many, many, many. Beyond his scientific work, Krauss has been one of the world's most active and successful science popularizers and a vocal advocate for science and reason versus pseudoscience and superstition. Lawrence, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> well, thanks. I don't know if there's any time left for the podcast after all that, but thanks again. <laughs> well, you know what? You've been doing this a long time, and I think it's really detrimental to, to not to to not to take that into account. And actually, I left out probably a couple days worth of things that you've done because you've been doing it for a long time. One, one of my favorites, and we'll just throw it in, the physics of Star Trek, a universe from nothing. Those are amazing books and uh, really have, have changed a lot of things. Um, we're going to get into some of those, and we're really here, honestly, to talk about your book, which I have right here, The oh, Physics of Climate Change. I absolutely love this book, and uh, we'll get into why. Uh, that's, the, that's the real book, although I've watched your podcast, I've read your other books, I, I, I know what it's about. I want to start out with the, the basic first question I ask all my guests. How in the hell have you weathered this crazy time we've been in this last 14, 15 odd months of just, you know, not only pandemic and and uh, Black Lives Matters and Asian racism and uh, inauguration on and on. I mean, I could go on a thousand other uh, crazy things that have been going on in the world uh, and has all this breadth of experience, knowledge at university, teaching 
the books you've written prepared you to weather this crazy time a little bit better? Or were you hit like uh, the majority of the 98% of believers in our world? No, non-believers I, I, of climate change. I felt very lucky. I, I, I was pretty lucky in the sense that it, our lives had sort of already been engineered a little bit around that. I, I, I had a refuge in Oregon where I lived. I'd already retired from my position at the university. And so we were relatively secluded in a beautiful spot in a, in a, in a small town in, in, by Portland, but we had a lovely yard with a stream and huge redwoods and other trees and it was lo lovely so that part was was not so bad i'd already we'd already kind of secluded ourselves already uh and then what i did um and we had just fortunately we had just let a uh, just let a cruise a trip uh, more than just a cruise to the to vietnam and cambodia which you know if you've read the new book it really had an impact yeah. and uh it, it just the first cases of covid were being reported in in, in actually in Vietnam, the day we left Vietnam. And, and so that was really lucky. And then I started to think about what I could do as I was home. What happened immediately was that almost all my commitments got canceled. I'd had six different international trips that were all canceled in the next seven months. And so for the first time in my life, I really had no other really uh, travel commitments. Literally, I, I travel every week for things. And, and so I started to think, what could I do? I'm not a first responder. And, um, and one of the things I did was I, uh, that I started these five minute physics videos. I thought, well, I'll, I'll teach people a little bit of physics. So I'll do a, maybe five to 10 or 15 minutes every day. Again, in a very relaxed and non, non high tech way. Um, I, I, and it was kind of fun. And I did 25 of them. I just thought I'd see what happened. But more than that, what I thought about was, well, I, um, I'd really, my trip in, in Cambodia really impacted on me in terms of thinking about climate change. And I prepared some lectures on it and I thought, well, maybe I should write a book. And, and it was an amazing experience because I wrote that book. Uh, I've never had a time. I've always had at least two or three other day jobs whenever I've written any of my other books. So I usually used to write between midnight and five in the morning and, and then, and give me time to do other things. And, um, with this book, I was able to write uh, 12, 14 hours a day and work on it. And I wrote that book in 10 weeks. And I've never written a book in less than a year. And, uh, and it just came out. I mean, I'd already been thinking a lot about it, but I, you know, I did a lot of learning and it really flowed nicely. And, and, and so it was, a, for me, I thank, if you wish, the COVID epidemic for giving me the opportunity to become completely secluded and have no other demands on my time. And I finally learned what it was like to be able to basically focus on something without it, uh, the rest of the world bothering me uh, for many hours a day. And, and I wrote that book and, and of course then, you know, other things began to happen, but uh, um, so it wasn't, it, it's much, I'm very fortunate. I, I, having been retired, it was much less traumatic for me than many people who lost their jobs or, or, or in other ways were impacted. But yeah, sure. My travel got impacted. They, and and I couldn't see some people or some family that I wanted to see. My my mother lived in Canada, and I still haven't seen her in a year and a half almost. Um, but uh, uh, it was a it was a nice opportunity, and I think I hope that people can t have been able to use you know while it's an inconvenience. For, if you have the the luxury to use that COVID time to do something you wouldn't do otherwise, and so I uh, it's it's at least afforded me that, and then yeah. it maybe may cause us to to plan and prepare to move, to leave the United States, which we did. And I just moved to Canada a week ago. Was, was that around any of the craziness of the inauguration and just kind of this extreme well, nationalism or any of those things influence United, or you're just saying? No, the atmosphere in the United States has certainly been getting us down in the last four, certainly the last four years at least. And we'd been thinking of, of, of getting out. And um, the last few years have been, uh, not just the crazy presidency and all the crazy nationalism, but the atmosphere of, of uh, rigid censorship that was going on in, in, in academia and elsewhere in the United States, all, all were convincing me. I would just wanted to get away from it all. And I'm at a beautiful location in Canada where I have a lot of space and, and, um, and, and I'm, you know, I've been enjoying it for a week. It just set this up in the last week, but uh, it, when I'm, and I'm in quarantine, but uh, I'm looking forward to, enjoying uh, 
a very different lifestyle than I than we had in the United States. Although I still the podcast is uh, well, I do it often locally here wherever I am. Um, we have a studio in Phoenix, and I'll I'll still head it down there every now and then to record some podcasts and and things, and of course some other travels. But uh, this will be my base here. That's beautiful. But really, you were originally from from Canada. You came down to the U.S., and and so you've always kind of you've not really had that nationalism from the beginning. You talk about it in a little bit. Uh, no, and, I, I, where know, you, I, I know. I know you live in in Germany, and and yeah. you know, what I often tell people is that. It, you really should live in more than one country to learn how ridiculous nationalism is. I moved down to the United States. I was anti-American when I grew up and then I moved down to the United States for graduate school. And that's when I learned the, this ridiculousness of assuming your country is the better than any other country. It's just differences. And, and, and I, and I learned there were certain things about the United States I didn't like, but Americans at the time were more open and easy to talk to in many ways than the Canadians when I grew growing up. And, and you just learn that there are dip, there are positives and negatives to every place. And I have no tolerance for nationalism. I didn't expect to ever move back to Canada. I've been in the States for 45 years, but although I lived in Australia, my wife's from Australia and I, I had a position there for a little while, visiting position, and I used to commute regularly. Uh, and I thought I might live in Australia or New Zealand, but, um, but we just decided to move to Canada. It was an easy thing to do because I'm Canadian and did, in the sense of, of bureaucracy. Um, and, uh, it's nice to be back in the British Commonwealth. <laughs> so now, n not only that craziness that, that we're hopefully on emerging out of to some extent and, and not going back to a normalization in any means, but uh, I, specifically on climate change and the, and the things that we've seen come up uh, uh, mixed in with a pandemic and that. Did, did all your years of speaking or teaching, even though it was physics, even though it was an atomic society, I mean, that I think, to correct me if I'm wrong, since you were on the atomic society, they switched uh, or they added climate change into the mix on the, the, the doomsday clock uh, because it was such a, a big concern. Um, did any of that knowledge and speaking about it and learnings that you received over the years help prepare you to say, no, I, th I think I'm going to get through uh, the, these climate calamities and these crises that are emerging better? Or are you just, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for resilience. Have, yeah, you, well, I does guess, any of you know, this give you resilience? Well, it, periodically resilience, periodically depression. I think, um, <laughs> I, I think, there's no doubt that my period in the Bolton Atomic Sciences gave me, it was like it be, being a student. It was being tutored for a dozen years. We actually changed things when I became chair of the, of the board. Uh, we added climate change and also bioterrorism and then eventually sort of artificial intelligence uh, issues as possible existential threats and moved beyond just nuclear weapons. That happened during my tenure as, as, as chair. Uh, but I'd be tutored every year. And, and, I, and I have to say, we'd set the doomsday clock and we'd have a doomsday symposium where we bring in world's experts on different subjects. And it was, it was fascinating. I learned a lot, but it was quite, we, we, I spent a week thinking about all the ways the world can end in one way or another. And that was, that was sobering. So I guess going, living through a dozen of those things, or uh, you learn that world, life goes on, I guess. And, and I think uh, I've experienced enough personal and professional and as well societal upheavals in my life that I realized that, you know, that in some sense, this too shall pass. Life goes on in one way or another. And, and I had already through my, through the podcast, but also through the, the connections with people, especially in climate change, climate scientists, some of them that I knew who were, who were, almost optimistic in the sense of realizing that there were opportunities here for civilization to do good things. And, and it's not all doom and gloom. And no matter what some people on the left in the United States may say, the world is not gonna end in 12 years due to climate change. It, 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 you know, it's a huge challenge, but it's a challenge that's long-term and we can minimize the long-term effects, which will be serious and they'll be serious anyway. But, but it's, not as if, it's not as if all hope is lost. And, uh, and we can learn how to, and, we, and, and also that it's happening. And there's not, you know, it's not something in the future and we can learn how to deal with it in ways that minimize 
or at least mediate some of the worst impacts. Uh, and we're fortunate also, I realize that compared to in the first world and where I was living, compared to, to say Vietnam and Cambodia, we're gonna face this real perfect storm of climate change and in some places don't have the funds to be able to address the rising sea level. And, and, and um, so we really have to realize while, there, while, while there's less urgency in the sense of immediate impacts from, for some of the world, that parts of the world need to be prepared. We need to help them uh, produce an infrastructure that, that allows them, <coughs> sorry, to combat climate change. The fact, uh, my parents, when I grew up, my parents had a, um, a small gift shop and there was a little sign up there. It had trinkets and it said, if you break it, it's yours. And, and I often say that that's the case with, with our world in some sense, the first world, the United States and Europe uh, have, have dump, been dumping carbon in the atmosphere for a hundred years. And, and the impacts will, the worst impacts, the most immediate impacts will happen in parts of the world that really didn't contribute to that. So we kind of have at least an ethical, I don't know whether you use the word moral, but an ethical obligation, I think, to, to reach out and assist because we've helped create the problem. So, I mean, you, you already answered the question really that it was almost a, a blessing in disguise to have that pause and period to write the book, which you did, I mean, six weeks. Um, I, I've, I followed how long it took you to write your other books over the past, and it's a, a accomplishment. But probably another thing that you didn't experience before, and I don't know if this was also a blessing or, a, or, or as well, how do you launch a book during lockdown and pandemic was that a little bit different was that any more difficult than than usual as well well yeah this everything about this book was different because i, I had i've never written let me make it clear i've never written a book without having a, a contract and an advance from a publisher before i wrote it this book i just sat down and wrote it i had not i had not no one was paying me no one was doing anything i just said i want to do this and i it's something I can maybe do to help the world in a way that other people are helping the world with being first responders and creating vaccines and doing things I can't do. Um, and so that already was quite different. The process of writing a book without knowing I had any way of necessarily publishing it was a new experience. And then as the book went on, after I wrote the first draft is when I started, or maybe even the middle, I started contacting publishers and thinking about this. And it was clear that the situation was incredibly different. Publishers weren't publishing books. Um, also, because I focused on the science, some publishers said, no, you have to, you have to focus on the emotions if you want to, we, we can't publish a book that's just, you know, the basic science, which is of course what's most important. And so I was really dismayed by that, uh, including some of my publishers who published my past books said, no, we, um, we, 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 can't, we can't do something that doesn't, doesn't, you know, isn't doom and gloom in some sense. Uh, and so it was a real struggle. I almost self-published this book. Um, and it was only at the very last stages that I, that I found a publisher um, through, through, a, a, through a, a, a colleague, a, a, um, got to know um, uh, Adam Bellow, who's the son of Saul Bellow, who you, you may know is a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, writer. Yeah. And, and Adam was a publisher in a, in a small company. And, um, and they agreed to publish it on a very different publishing arrangement. And then and then through my, ultimately through connections with my friend, Richard Dawkins, um, I, I, I uh, came in contact with a lovely publishing company in England uh, called Head of Zeus, and they wanted to publish it in the UK. So I almost self-published, but not, happily, I guess, uh, I published with them, but it was, but you're right, it's very different that, you know, you don't do, you don't do book tours. Um, uh, the uh, Bookstores were closed when my book came out. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a challenge, but I don't really, I had decided I didn't really care about that aspect of, of writing the book. I, I wanted to get it out and do what I could to encourage people. And I have a large social media following, but, um, but I wasn't gonna stress over, over sales or anything else. And I think um, I've tried to learn uh, from my, uh, my friend uh, who, who I've done a podcast with Woody Allen who basically says, you know, when he writes and does a movie, by the time the movie's out, he's on to the next thing. And so uh, I just told myself, I do this, I do what I could and, and ha maybe have an impact. And my foundation has tried to make it have a bigger impact. We've just finished a week ago, finally, sending uh, 
535 copies to every member of Congress and the Senate, uh, hoping to have an impact. And, and so we hope it'll have a public impact there. But, you know, I put it out and I've done what I can and I'm, and I'm, and I'm moving on. And, and yeah, the, 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 the sales rates, be, probably because I didn't do book tours and, and because it wasn't doom and gloom and for other reasons, not a single review of my book. It's, it's very different than every other book I've ever done. There's not a single published review of my book in any newspaper or magazine, which is the first for me. And, um, but that's okay. And, you know, right. people are enjoying it and, and some people are reading it and then, yeah, there's a, it's a small fraction of the sales of, of my previous books, but, but I hope it'll have some impact in the long run. And that's all I care about. Well, as you said, it really wasn't about the sales, but I still think that there's a strong reach and impact. There's a lot of companion tools that you have for the book and a lot of your podcasts and videos or little lectures that you do. You actually do with Think Inc. a, a, a wonderful type of full on with the slides, the graphs, you talk about the book and it's almost like um, uh, a climate change uh, training, physics of climate change type of a training, uh, uh, fabulously done. Um, uh, I really thank you for that. I, I've also watched that. I've heard a lot of, I personally have heard a lot of- a second and say, we did that sure. in collaboration with Thinking, but that's one of the things my foundation did. We said, let's yeah. prepare an online media live presentation. And then I, I did it with Thinking because I knew they're in Australia, but you know, that's one of the things the foundation tries to do is to try and make useful companion things for the book without, without making it all, all about book sales. Yeah. Sorry. And on. then, and then at the end, you pause, you, you pause, gave people a kind of a, a popcorn break or break. To, and then you answered questions, which was uh, amazing. So uh, I thank you for that. I I'm one of the first 50 people who was trained by Al Gore and his ranch in Carthage, Tennessee. Oh. And so I'm a climate reality leader. I've went through that he uses a, a lot of the, you, you, you guys both have used some similar things like uh, Dr. James Hansen's or, yeah, or Professor Hansen, James Hansen from, from yeah. Goddard Institute. Uh, um, um, uh, so there's a lot of similarities, except his is more, has more of that emotion and his statistics and data is also from, from others. And it's, um, one other caveat, when I think it's chapter three or four you, you in the book, you get to that chapter and say, if you've made it this far through all these graphs and this, that, okay, it's downhill from, from here on out. We've covered, <laughs> covered the hard stuff, but, but really you also say it, it is basic math. There is not, we're not getting into some deep complex equation it is pretty basic. Should have learned it in school. Uh, Most people if, should, yeah. but they're afraid. I mean, there's nothing in there that you, wouldn't and there's no mathematics that you couldn't have done in, in high school maybe even middle school but people are still terrified when they see an equal sign you know yeah oh terrified absolutely and, and uh, so I, i'm so glad that uh you know uh richard dawkins you know gave you the the tip on the publisher and that that came to fruition i do want to ask you some questions about tours that you've done around the world with him in, in a bit but really, we touched upon it. So in the, in the book sprung up from the tours that you do. You do these tours. The foundation does these tours now. Hopefully, some, some new dates will pop up and come eventually. Mm -hmm. I, I see that there's uh, one for sure set sometime in 2024 at the eclipse. And, and uh, I, I hope to eventually be in those or, or be able to join. Yeah, but we, I'm gonna... just about to announce one to Greenland. We had one to Greenland. That yeah. Was canceled because of COVID and we're redoing it for September, 2022. And it'll great, be me and, um, and, 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 and a different set of lectures than we were originally having because my friend Ian McEwen from England could, can't do it. But, but Barry Barish, who won the Nobel Prize in physics for LIGO uh, will be, he and his wife will be accompanying me. So we'll give lectures on, on, on the universe while we're up there under the Northern Lights in Greenland. Uh -huh. I love it. So uh, we'll definitely put that in the show notes and links so people can look at those when, when they emerge and they come out. But we're, we're talking uh, the Mekong Delta, Mekong River, uh, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, were, um, were kind of sprung up through that. You, at the first of your book, that's how you start, kind of start out. And at the end of the book, that's how you really wrap up. Um, a lot with uh, sea level rise and uh, issues and things that are happening uh, in that respect. But that leads me to, to this 
kind of a, a bigger question. So during this crazy time that we've ex experienced, you know, not only nationalism and, and uh, division of, of everybody, but how do you feel about global citizenry or global citizenship and the removals of nations and borders and divisions of humanity one from another? Do you think that in, in, in and of itself would be kind of uh, something that would make a bigger dent or, or, or push forward the, the, these global problems that we're experiencing? And just, I just wanna know your thoughts and feelings on that because we are dealing with global problems. Yeah, they're all global and the world isn't really well prepared to deal with global problems. It never had to in the past, really. It's new, new first for humanity. Nuclear weapons were the first global problem and we haven't dealt with them very well. Uh, I, as someone who's been, if you want, an immigrant a number of times, um, I have a, I have a, sort of a gut level distaste of, of um, well, not only of nationalism, but of, of global borders in, in some sense. I, 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 uh, immigration is an area and it's built on fear of others. And, and, and you know, countries are trying to keep out people who need to, to, who need to escape from where they are. And there's a ton, you know, there's a ton of room in, in a lot of countries like the United States. And, and this notion that others are dangerous and they take jobs away generally <clears throat> that's just garbage. Generally, they they'll do the jobs other people won't do, and most of them contribute more to the globe to the economy than they take out. And so, I have, I if I had my way, I would I would have more open borders and 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 not and, and, and even though I know it goes against the grain, and people are afraid. Uh, I think it uh, ultimately. Um, we, we do live in a, a global society and we need to recognize that um, that people that immigrants contribute generally more to the country than they take out. I just recently watched uh, your discussion with Noam Chomsky. Uh, I think you split it up into a couple parts yeah. and you actually asked him, asked him that as well. You, you um, ended up saying, you know, what, what if we, just you know, remove the borders. We let them in and fit, filled the spaces of whatever country. And as specifically, you were speaking about the U.S. and 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 um, Noam was as well. And it's, it's, most of the study and information we have is that actually the economy would thrive, things would go better, and 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 a lot of positive things would come in, into respect. I, I lived in Phoenix, where where they did awful things to to undocumented immigrants from Mexico. Um, and, and it was just so ridiculous because um, the city, they had a, a, an awful, I wouldn't, I mean, probably racist, but just a ridiculous sheriff who, who rounded up people without any documentation, with, even if they were documented, but they rounded them up and put them in these jails in the desert in inhuman conditions. And these people, you, you could see they, they were paying taxes and contributing. They were, they were producing, they were the, necessary for phoenix to exist and it was and treating them as set, literally second class citizens was just disgusting to me yeah and i i mean i we i i tend to even i'm from the u.s so i tend to pick on the u.s and especially during the time that trump was in office the oompa loompa um yeah. the orange problem but, yeah. but it really it, it's all over the world so i mean we're seeing we're seeing uh you know the duartes the shays the erdogan's the Putin's the and even in the Brexit was a very nationalistic thing about people yeah. taking jobs. So they voted on Brexit, but now during the lockdown, all those jobs were waiting to be filled, and none of them could come back in because there was a lockdown. Uh, uh, United Kingdom was locked yeah. down, and so a lot of food was wasted. A lot of jobs that needed to be filled were not fillable, and, and none of those people from who voted did made the vote jumped into those jobs and. And there's um, just some not long-term thinking when, when it's on political decisions and things like that. But I, I really appreciate you sharing that, that, that view on global citizenry. And uh, the, it, it's kind of, I'm kind of leading you in a direction of where we're going. So um, you're, uh, 
we, we mentioned Noam Chomsky. And so he was at MIT. You were at MIT. Noam was at Arizona State University. You are as well as that. Is, is there like a deep tire relationship on how, how that works? Or is, is that happenstance? No, no. Well, it, 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 no, it, it happened. Uh, I was a student at MIT. I did my PhD yeah. and almost professor there. And, and I didn't, one of the nice things about MIT that I liked in doing my PhD is that there were basically no required courses. Just take some exams. And, and, and so I, I, what I did do was take a class, two classes from Noam Chomsky on the U.S. foreign policy. Um, in, which was in physics. I guess I audited them, and he, but he let me do that, and um, and I got to know him a little, and he and he was such a nice man. I would go and talk to him as a student after, you know, in his office, and he'd open the door and let me talk, and amazed me that I, I was able to do that. And I, and I also attended public lectures by him and other people who I think of as role models that have deeply affected the way I, when I was fortunate enough to kind of be in a somewhat similar position with the public. You know, he would lecture and then he'd stay afterwards for two hours and answer questions. And, 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 I, and that was so important. And I would try to emulate that if I can. Um, you I you definitely lecture. emulate that. And so fun. does he. I just yeah, wrote him an email uh, two days ago and he replied back um, immediately. I mean, he's so diligent and he's always been known for that for years. Oh, yeah. But the, the just... reason, yeah. Anyway, so we became friends. And then what happened is when I, Later on, I moved from MIT to Harvard. I had a position in a fancy thing called the Society of Fellows. And I knew, I was quite aware that Noam had been a, a fellow. We were called junior fellows. And in his career, he actually, that's where he did his work, initial work on linguistics while he was doing his PhD, when he was in the Harvard Society of Fellows. And so there's dinners once a week where you can invite people. So I invited Noam back to one or two dinners and um, he was nice enough to come and then we got to know each other and then over the years communicated all, every now and then and then um, then when I moved to Arizona and I decided to do some uh, public events uh, I, I did get Noam involved and, and I, I did a dialogue a, a, a Q&A with Noam which was the first time we did he's ever done you know we did that for two hours in front of 3,000 people uh, as we used to do and no, and Noam's wife had died, and and Noam remarried, um, and his wife's from Brazil, and and I think uh, the winters in Max in Massachusetts were a little harsh, and um, so I, I actually tried to encourage Noam to move out to Arizona. Now, as it worked out, I tried to get him to come to Arizona State University, and we, he and I met with the president of the university, but he eventually went to University of Arizona, which is in Tucson, because he had several former students who were in the linguistics department. So it was sad for me. He didn't come to ASU, although now, uh, since I'm not there, it doesn't matter. Um, and and but I but at least he was close enough to visit and uh, uh, in Tucson and and um, right. and uh, and so we now we became over the years closer and closer friends and and he and his and he and his wife are lovely and um, and I'm very fortunate to be close friends with him and he's a wonderful man and and an inspiration at ninety something to be so be so sharp and. And open Absolutely. And, and to someone like me, who's 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 retired now from academia, uh, uh, Noam isn't. He's still teaching at university. He's still teaching at University of Arizona, and yeah. uh, but I'm not at the university. And so to um to to be able to realize that I I can continue to be productive and active and hopefully for many years is an important thing for me personally. I'm so glad that you tied those. And the other thing that I mentioned to to Noam when 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 we were speaking, he's getting overwhelmed with commitments and, yeah, and sure that. Um, there's another alumni of MIT, Dennis Meadows, Professor Dennis Meadows, who wrote the Limits to Growth. I don't know. I remember the Limits to Growth. It was yeah, I remember yeah. it was really important to me when I was younger. I remember reading. Yeah, Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, your grand and Steve Barons, and. Um, and so he I, he, I asked him to be on the podcast and he, he says, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm going to give it over to the next generation. He, although he did answer the question and I, and I just, he, I think he's 78 now, but nowhere close to, to Noam and to some of the others. I mean, uh, J, James Lovelock, 101, just wrote the Nova scene. I've got that book here. Oh, I don't wow. know if you've, I, I don't no, know if you've yeah. read that, but, no, uh, but it's, but you know, uh, these, 
these great elders and mentors of, of, uh, of great books and, and, and thought theories that, that are still out there going strong and answering emails and stuff is, is absolutely amazing. Where I was going is really you you originally started cosmology, right? And mm -hmm. and um, I'm a big fan and, and uh, of Carl Sagan. I had his daughter Sasa Sagan on, on the podcast on her book. So Carl Sagan said it uh, the best. R really, we're all star stuff. We're we're made up of star stuff and and the areas of collapsing stars, you know. Um, and really, we crawled out of this primordial soup of, of the earth, you know, um, the earth birth started at these basic elements and bacteria of life and, and, and went to today, but we weren't dropped off here and, you know, planet Canada or spaceship Canada or spaceship Germany, we we're all crawled out of the earth. And I'm really big on um, that, what he said, but also how that ties to this, that we're all crew members on this spaceship earth originally coined by Kenneth Boulding, I guess. And, and then, then later uh, um, Carl Sagan actually says, you know, there's this rising consciousness that sees the earth as a single organism and an organism at war with itself is doomed. And, and, and that kind of ties back to why I asked you about this global citizen and, and that, and, and um, as someone who's studied in this field who who knows Carl Sagan and, and many others who've who've talked about that. What what is your view? How how is humanity really shifting to realize that new consciousness and that um we really need to work together to solve this uh situations uh, where you know I, I've been pessimistic or at least disappointed in the ability of humanity to address the truly global challenges that we face in the 21st century. In some sense, that's another positive from the pandemic, I guess, is that it really the first time it was explicitly clear that the interconnectedness of, of, of society and to some extent how, how sure it caused borders to be closed and the same kind of xenophobia, but at the same time, the recognition that ultimately to make a kind of forced altruism that to make yourself safe, you want to make sure that the, there aren't outbreaks in other countries. You want to make sure there's vaccines in other countries because in the end it comes back to you. And so that's the first time I began to see that people marginally recognize that and acted on that way. I, I still am not impressed with the, with the, with the net progress, but, but um, at the same time, climate change has certainly mobilized maybe that's maybe mobilized is is, is it, it's captured uh, uh, the consciousness of of a lot of the pe people in the world as a global issue uh, even if people don't understand the details which is one of the reasons why i wrote a book about the details uh but i think that really again is for me the first time this emerging especially among the younger generation this emerging realization that that um uh, no one country can can solve the problem and, uh, and yet every pro country can contribute to the problem. And uh, that I think is, um, is uh, an important potential sea change. We'll see what happens. We'll see if that gets implemented in terms of policies, but certainly young, the next, this younger generation is certainly aware of it in a way that, the old, that, that my generation certainly was not. You, you say that 98% of, of humanity is disengaged from climate and only really 2% is kind of in a bubble of engagement around the climate and maybe a little bit more during this time where they've, you know, the lights went on better or they've realized uh, that may, may, hopefully that number's gone up whether or not. And um, you, you also kind of mentioned that some some people in, in your circles, even though you're, you're in fabulous circles, uh, don't believe or, or you can't discuss these things with them is still kind of a, a debate or a controversy. And, and that was kind of a, another tool just to lay out the physics. I mean, this is the, the physics, the basics 
of climate change. Um, I, I, for for Warren, I can't believe that that's true. That you have people in, in your circles that are that way, and maybe. I, I don't know. I don't want to throw you under the bus or hurt your friendship circle, but how 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 does that develop? How? Uh, um, well, I really I can't say that. I I mean I know I've, I've debated people who are yeah. climate deniers, but in terms of people I interact with regularly, it wasn't that there were people who were who didn't believe in climate change. There are people who are who are skeptical, are naturally skeptical. They don't want to be told what to do without they did without sort of understanding it and, and a good and they were in my mind when i was writing the book and one of my friends penn gillette who's from penn and teller is yeah. kind of had a reputation as a climate denier but that's not true he basically just said when people tell me something i just you know don't accept it and when they tell me i have to do something i don't accept it unless i understand it so he i i wrote this book and saying with him in mind saying look here here's here's the, the physics here's the science here's the underlying issues so that you can decide yourself what policies you want to have. And, and he wrote back saying, this is the book I'd always been waiting for. In fact, he wrote something to that effect on the back of the cover of the book. Yeah. So I guess uh, he was, he had a, he got a bad rap as a reputation as a climate denier when he really wasn't. Um, and so the people I, the, the people I know, I mean, all the scientists, I know obviously accept the realities of climate change, what, where people will differ is, is in some sense, the policy implications, and that's okay. I'm fine. I mean, different people can have different priorities for policy as long as they don't de debate the facts. And, and yeah. so to, you need to have some understanding of the facts before you can then go on and say, what should we be doing next? And among my, among my colleagues and friends are people with widely different views on, on the extent to which policies should be implemented. So that, that's okay. And I think that's what's necessary in a democracy. An informed electorate ultimately makes the decisions about what their priorities are, but they should be informed first. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's really um, another version of what you've said before about religion. So this human freedom is truly enlightenment of knowledge. You know, opening up uh, not just the ability to question uh, whether it is climate change, but also the ability to receive a a scientific answer, you know, a, a, a physical based answer so that they can get into the, 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 the realities. Um, and I love how, how you do that throughout the book. The first, the, I can't remember if it was a third or the fourth, but it was really, I was like, oh no, here's another graph, a chart, a, a statistic. And, and, and that is definitely something that uh some of us will have to get used to but it's Absolutely. really all yeah all as you realized, said you it's know, I basic I, I, you know i thought about this again if i wanted i, I remember my friend Stephen hawking said that for every equation you have in a book the sales cut in half and he was just joking in some sense but but i realized that if i had fewer for many people graphs and charts are intimidating but for me a picture is worth a thousand words and i wanted to put them there so that people if they wanted to, could work through them. And they, they shouldn't, it's kind of sad that for many people, graphs are intimidating, but, but it's a good way to learn how to use it. But, but the data is so essential. Science is an empirical discipline, physics and all of sciences. And, and, and you really can't discuss something like climate change, even if you're discussing the theories behind it without talking about the data and the evidence. And, and also what it allowed me to provide besides a, a graphical picture that can often explain. And, and for people who had trouble with the graphs in the, in the text, I try and explain what they're seeing. So that hopefully helps them. But, but what it also provided was an, was, was a, uh, an opportunity to have a resource so that each of those graphs connects to an online resource in general where you can go and learn more. And one of the things I want to do in the book, and it's the first time I've ever done this at the end of the book, because I have a whole set of online resources where you can go to learn more about these issues. And because obviously in any book like this, it's just a just a beginning for those if you really want to learn more. I don't I don't know if you know uh, Dr. John Cook, who did uh, climate change versus cranky uncle or cranky uncle versus climate change. He kind I've of heard, I've heard I've heard yeah. of it, but I have a co colleague of his. Uh, um, Richard Somerville, who was with me in, yeah. in Vietnam, who's who, yeah. who, uh, who is often given lectures about talking to your cranky uncle. 
Yeah, there, there's basically, I mean, he's, uh, the, it's that fl fly, fight or flight or this, uh, it, you know, if we see a lion, a tiger, a bear or something, we're like, we've run. But if we see another graph, we're like, oh, another graph, a chart. <laughs> but it's really easy. Uh, don't be afraid of the equal sign and the little bit of math in here. The graphs and charts are absolutely fabulous. And the, not only uh, even in the audible version are those downloadable, but then you, you offer that companion lecture where you actually go through it and listen to you, to you talk about it and explain it in, in great detail um, is very nice. And I promise all those who read it, you know, you get, get to chapter three or four, it's all downhill from there. And it's a, and it's a, it's a beautiful read. Um, I want to go, I, I don't want to tease or give away the book too much because I want people to get out there and read it and, and look at your stuff online as well. And I'll put those in the show description, but I, I, I want to kind of, uh, touch on, on a few things. So, um, you, you talk in there that we need to kind of accept what nature is telling us. Uh, uh, you, you reference Thomas Lovejoy um, and, and some of his fabulous uh, work as well. But as you mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, one of your friends is Richard Dawkins. You did a tour with him, mainly speaking about, I guess, evolution and religion and, and, and cosmology. I mean, Richard would cosmology. Talk about cosmology, and I talk about physics. And uh, yeah, we were we were combating pseudoscience, but it was often religion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I I love I love how how that went and, and but I, I and I don't know if you can answer this, but I want to ask you because it you know it ties to your field of study and also you and being friends and having debated and, and went back and forth with him. Um, Lynn Margulis, Doctor Lynn Margulis, now passed. She she debated Richard Dawkins quite a bit, and um, there's this thing that I want to touch a touch upon a little bit and um, one on natural selection or survival of the fittest or only the strong survive. And I think that's kind of where Lynn Margulis and Richard divided. She was more saying a symbiosis, a, a cooperation and collaboration. Hypothesis. Yeah. The, well, that's what James Lovelock, they were good friends as well. And, and the funny thing is, is she's the first wife of Carl Sagan she's when Margulis wife, was. Yeah. 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 And he then the she was National Academy. He never was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it was really, I mean, that's an interesting connection, but then it, it, it leads more to you, you want us to accept what the natural world is telling us, but you also uh, um, and that's kind of the symbiotic relationship, or even what I said before, what Carl Sagan said is that, you know, we're star stuff, uh, um, yeah. and, and we're connected to this earth as this organism that I think is more, I don't know if it's related because they were married. I don't think it is, but, um, Lynn was saying the same, whereas in some circles I've seen Richard almost say that it's the survival of the fittest natural selection. And I, I just don't, in the debates, well, think, did that ever come up? Sort of stereo, both of them are stereotype types of their positions. They're not really different, okay. I think. I mean, okay, okay. The, the, I mean, Lynn Margulis's claim to fame has to do with mitochondria and, and realization yeah, yeah. in some sense that mitochondria, which are the energy parts of every cell uh, uh, and oxygen users in every cell, really probably occur uh, were individual organisms that were then in, in a sense merged together um, in an ultimate act of symbiosis. But that's, okay. but that's a perfect example of the kind of evolutionary trend that, that Richard and, and the selfish gene that Richard talked about. That, that, that merging, which allows life to use oxygen and generate yeah. a lot more energy is a perfect example of natural selection in, in, in working. So I think, I think that the claim that they're come a kind of um, um, at odds is probably an overstatement. Uh, they're both, they're really both on the same side, I think. And they stress different things. Now, Lynn Margulis got a little um, yeah. more, um, how can I say it, more fanciful perhaps later on. And, um, and uh, 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 so maybe there were some problems there. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the reason I asked that is because, you know, uh, Carl Sagan, he wrote The Cosmos, Lynn Margulis wrote uh, The uh, Microcosmos, and, yeah. and, and, and I, I've heard Richard speak about this as well, that, you know, we crawled out of the primordial soup, and I've heard you both on, on stage, and he eloquently s says that. I'm just trying to say, how do we get to this human condition or have you ever dealt with this human condition which relates to how do you speak to people why are we at odds with each other why can't we unify well, you know, is it is it a human condition is it something uh, well, how, how do we divide we ran an event for my origins project at asu on on xenophobia the origins of xenophobia which which you know have real biological organisms from the red blood cells and 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 the reason we can fight disease is recognizing outsiders even as a molecular cellular level can be very important for life living systems to to survive so we have these built-in in some sense we have a built-in fear of others and it and it was very important in the early evolution of hominids and 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 animals in general and 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 it's something we it's sort of a residual um byproduct of evolution that that we need in some sense now to intellectually get over i think we have a we have a natural evolutionary psychology that uh, 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 sort of, to some extent, a fear of others that, as I say, that worked and was useful in the early development of, of civilizations and, and, and tribes. And we're very tribal. And I think we have to overcome that. And that's one of the things that science does for me, you see. We, science forces us to overcome various natural human inclinations that are, um, that are negative residual byproducts of evolution. The fact that we all want to believe is another, another one. And science gives us a set of tools that allow it to overcome that. And similarly, a set of tools that can, science is the one truly global activity that where, where, science, where people from literally thousands of different cultures, hundreds of different cultures, let's say, and dozens of different languages can work together with uh, the same language. And, you know, you go to CERN and they're, thousands of physicists from hundreds of countries that are just working together with a common language and a common goal. And, um, and so that's to me, one of the great utilities of science that provides a prototype, it provides as well as the tools to allow us to be truly global. So uh, you, you can choose not to answer this, but I wanna kind of see if I'm even can lead it in, in, in the right direction. Joseph Campbell wrote this book, The Inner Reaches of Outer Space. I don't know mm -hmm. how you feel about it, but basically he wrote and talked a lot about different mythologies. There are more than 20 civilization frameworks in our world, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, on and on. Majority of those all collapse because environmental or ecological collapse. And um, it's also, you know, whether xenophobia was involved in that as well, but they did collapse. And so now we go and take a selfie at the Parthenon or at the Colosseum or yeah. somewhere else. And, but we don't understand that that was pretty advanced civilizations that are no longer here. They're gone. And um, what, what, past. And, and yeah, that's a <laughs> I mean, and we realize we should realize that the world's great, the, the great world powers now uh, will if the past is any guide, will not be the same set in the in the in the future. Yeah, that that's exactly what I want to ask. Do do you feel like we're there's gonna that there's gonna be a collapse? Do you see a new civilization framework oh. emerging or something? Uh, no, I don't try and not to make predictions about the near future. It's too hard. But 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 I do certainly. You're certainly seeing the world dynamic changing. The United States was the un uncontested leader in technology and and science and, and, and in some sense, um, economics for a long time. And that's, that's clearly changing. China is, is building up and the United States is, is trying to fight it, but I suspect it's a losing battle. And, and so the preeminence of the United States as a political, economic and scientific power is waning. And I think that's natural. Now, the problem is I suspect the United States will not go quietly into the night as say Britain did Britain was a world power and eventually became kind of a marginal power. And, and, that, and happily, in the, they didn't take the rest of the world with them as they, as they subsided in preeminence. I am much more 
concerned, I don't know if that's the word more sanguine about, about the, the, the likelihood that the United States will go down quietly. <laughs> I don't think that'll happen. And so yeah. uh, I think there'll be some uh, unrest and upheaval and I don't think, um, and we'll see what happens, but, but, you know, w let's hope it, 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 let's hope that ultimately we can evolve to a global uh, scientific and economic community before any one country takes takes the rest of the world down in, in 2013 you had a wonderful um i think it was around january february at davos um you were at the world economic forum uh kind of the, the lone ranger on, on a panel with a, a of a lot of others kind of coming down on all sides um from everything from Muslim to to Jewish to Christian, yeah, it was, yeah, it was like a joke. It was me and a, a priest and a rabbi and an imam. It was a bad day. joke. It was like it was one of it's the beginning of a joke. Anyway, yeah, it, it definitely was. And, and um, you, so eloquently, you you uh, you uh, held your ground and it was very much all audience questions, panelist questions. It was wonderful, but the the reason I bring it up is really we we've wasted a lot of time in the debate of of religion and God and 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 we've also which is very similar. That's why I'm bringing it up. We've also wasted a lot of time in climate change. Is it real? Is it not? Is it coming? You know, and um, both, in my view, verge on. Uh, a criminal waste of time in that debate, especially for climate change, in, in, in my opinion, uh, it, it can be very criminal because we're wasting time where we could act to do something to get us out of the situation to meet the Paris Agreement 1.5. What are your feelings on that time wasted? That why interpret uh, ignorant beliefs? Why not just stick to the science? I mean, that's why I like your book science just the physics the facts and and laid out nicely not a debate let's move on and, and do something and so i kind of want to uh, get your you thoughts or feelings on it's, it's almost it's tragic in a sense that what i tried to show in, in the book and and things i've learned from colleagues it, it the urgency of climate of dealing with climate change isn't that tomorrow the world's going to collapse it's that the carbon we put up in the atmosphere today stays there. And so if we're trying to mediate the effects, every year that we continue to dump 10 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere, there's another, is, it, it means it, it, there's 10 gigatons more up there. And it means if we wanna produce less than a net total amount of carbon in the atmosphere, we're closer and closer to that limit. And so that means in order to, do something, it requires more drastic re response. Had we, had we started to act, the point is people have been talking about this for 40 years, but even had we started to act in 2010, think about it, in 2010, and we started to cut back 30%, then that'd be 30 gigatons of carbon that wouldn't be in the atmosphere now, and it would be less of a challenge now. So every year we wait, the challenge gets greater for us to have to, in order, if we're going to try and meet some, some goal of a certain amount of carbon or temperature change. And it's, it's sad that so that, that, that open call that these, this was not, this is not new. It was known for a long time was completely ignored globally for so long. But on the other hand, it's not surprising. I guess it's not surprising to me as someone who's been involved in thinking about nuclear weapons a lot for 40 years, because uh, for 75 years, people have been talking about the threat of nuclear weapons but, and proliferation, but you know, the United States and Russia each still have 5,000 nuclear weapons apiece and 1,000 oh, apiece on hair trigger alert. And, and so we, you know, the fact that people don't learn is, uh, is not perhaps too surprising to me that it takes time, it's, especially if there are interests, global interests that, that are, who, whose self-interest goes against the global interest. And so uh, powerful interests who will try to stop or change the discussion or moderate the discussion or, or, or diffuse or, 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 or deflect um, or distort. And that's certainly happened in the case of climate change. And um, uh, 
but as it has happened in the case of nuclear weapons, creating fear of others often is a way to convince people that you need more, more weapons. And, um, and, and, and I've said this before, and you probably heard me say it, but right after the first atomic bombs were dropped, Einstein said, everything has changed, save the way we think. And, and, and that still remains true 75 years later. You, you've had, I mean, just on, on your show, um, so many wonderful people. You're surrounded by greats. I mean, uh, you, you've mentioned them here on the podcast. Um, I, I'm sure you thought about this. You like to, well, I don't know if you like, but you do debate. You have discussions. You, you, you've talked about these things to many people over the years. Um, and I, I think, you. I hope, You've answered the, the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? Where do we need to go? What do we at the end of your book? You give us a lot of hope and optimistic. You also tie it back in into the Mekong um, and what's going on. Um, can you kind of answer the burning question for me? WTF, where are we going? Oh, what's okay. the future? Well, is the there future, a plan? The future is what we make it, and the future there are uh -huh. many possible futures as I. In the book, I talk about Charles Dickens, you know, Christmas story, that future as it, you know, the Christmas, ghost Christmas future wasn't the future as it will be, but as it might be. And, and we, and I think I wrote one of my favorite lines in there that I wrote was uh, the future's storming towards us like a freight train, but it's doing it yes. on tracks that we have built. And so it's up to us that's, uh, that to, to decide on what future we have. And I, I, I don't know what the future will be. I'm, on days, certain days pessimistic, on other days less pessimistic. Um, uh, but we certainly will not arrive at a better future if we keep our heads in the sand. If we fuse, if our policies aren't based on reality, then it's quite likely that the future will be worse than it is today. And so all I can say is we need to base our policies on reality. Having done that, as I say, policy recommendations will be very different. And, you know, the scientists may want one thing, but, but it may not be appropriate for politicians or the public to want to do that. But we need to at least recognize what the challenges are and what the consequences, likely consequences will be. And I suspect that uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Let me just say that. Yeah, the data and science, I mean, again, to what you've said before, um, except what nature is telling us, even though you present that in math and, and graphs and charts, it's the same thing. That data comes from nature. It comes from our world. And, and, and it is telling us something that is ex extremely telling. One big, huge takeaway that, that, I, that I had, and I thank you for this, is, you know, I really thought a, a lot of the the problems began to emerge around the 70s, 68, 70s, and in that area, as well around the, you know, the limits to growth was 72. Mm -hmm. and, and you really tell us, no, it was actually the 50s. And uh, um, when it, and, and, and that was a big eye opener, because it, it is so true. We're putting all this greenhouse gas emissions in, in there. And, and really, when, when, when organizations, when cities, companies, corporations, countries say we're going to reduce our carbon emissions this year by 60% or by 70%, or we're going to go plastic free by 2030, what are they telling us? They're still doing wrong. They're just doing it a lot slower. So they're going slower in the wrong direction. And it, even if the entire world today were to stop on a dime and, 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 and turn around the right direction, the earth doesn't just say, oh, everybody stopped and now they're doing the right thing. Poof, all those greenhouse gas emissions, plastic, all that no, just, air pollution's gone. Oceans store the heat and the heat's going to yeah. continue to rise for a while. I mean, that's the point. We've already, there's certainly things that are written in stone. Just one of the things that surprised me when I first learned it is that sea level rise at a, uh, it, almost half of the observed sea level rise is not due to melting of glaciers, just water heating up. And that's going to continue. And more or less, no matter what we do, we're going to get about a quarter of a meter sea level rise, even if there's no glaciers melt, just from the fact that just from the heat we've been dumping the 3.4 billion Hiroshima level atomic bombs worth of heat that we have dumped into the ocean over the last 25 years due to due to additional um, uh, um, what's called radiative forcing, additional 
heat energy that that hasn't been radiated into space and um um you know that's that's daunting it really is and and uh, you you speak about dr james hansen's work in, in the book as well and and he's well quoted uh, when I first started in, in uh, uh, climate speaking and that, the, I think the number was like a 250,000 atomic Hiroshima class atomic bombs going off every day, single day for uh, 365 days a year. Now, the last uh, that I know of was about 500,000. Uh, the number's gone up, well, it's obviously. Like four per sec it's like four per second. So you can work. Yeah, it's um, uh, unbelievable. And, and so the, there's some really fabulous things and, and don't have a heart attack or bury your head in the sand. It's not all doom and gloom, but it's important to not be ignorant, to have the knowledge, the facts, to know the basics um not so that you can debate about it so that you can quit saying is it sure is it real let's do something about it so i, I really like that a lot um and and i think unless you have something else on the book that's really all i wanted to talk about the book unless there's one more thing no, that no, you would no. like to add i think it's a fine introduction obviously you know there's more we can talk about but the book is the book and people can take a look at it i hope they they do. Uh, the point is, it's short on purpose. It's a very short book, a quick read, <clears throat> and and um, and, and I, I'm I'm very happy with the way it, it sort of ultimately flowed. I, you know, when I write a book, I really don't know where it's going, so uh, it's as short as I could make it. it. It couldn't be any shorter. Let me put it that way. And uh, uh, hopefully, um, and and the thing about the and the way I write, try and write my books is that if there's a if there's a subject or a graph that you don't understand you don't lose the rest of the train of the book i mean just skip it and 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 it, and it won't be as if you suddenly can't can't get the rest and so i try and have it modular in that sense so hopefully that'll help anyway that's all, that's that that was fun I, well, I, I appreciate it. I've got a couple more questions before we're done. Uh, I want to go go touch a little bit on uh, because we've touched on politics a little bit about uh, what's going on in the world. There's this great uh, book. I don't know if you've read it. It's called Treconomics. It's the economics of Star Trek. Yeah, it's a it's a derivative book from my book, The Physics of Star Trek. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. There was a lot, there were twenty different books, maybe twenty two that came out after The Physics of Star Trek because it was very popular. There's the biology, there's the philosophy, and there was this yeah Treconomics. Anyway, yeah. So I haven't read it, but but I'm aware. Well, of it. When we were growing up, we had these beautiful images of Star Trek and and what the future could be, and and a lot of those things we've come close. We've realized under some. The last uh, couple of decades from the media and the TV that I watch or that I know others watch, there's really have, it's been very dystopian, dystopian movies, dystopian series, fighting over resources, not a lot of ones that I know of that you could watch and say, well, that's something you could strive for. And I'm, I really hope, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Herzog and, and, and many others who make films, you've been in many films yourself as well. Um, that this knowledge, this um, this ignorance disappears about the situation we're living in our world. And instead of the doom and gloom dystopian, that we can get some medium out there that's not a TED Talk, not not a black mirror, that kind of can present this, this great stuff in a way that's interesting to watch, interesting to say, that shows us a depiction of the future, even 2030, even 2050, that that shows us a different way to live, even if it's movie magic. And I, I would kind of like to know, uh, the reason I like Trekonomics is that really Star Trek didn't have a, 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 a currency. They had a whole yeah. new form of, uh, of uh, economics that really, yeah. I mean, movie magic, it worked. Yeah, and yeah, I, absolutely. I, I would just like to see more media and things for us to strive for in the future that showed us what does it look like to live in, in, in a world in 2030 that maybe has renewable energy, autonomous cars, or things that don't harm human health or our planet in that process. And then let us engineer, create, architect, design that future just the same way we did with Star Trek, because we had a vision to say, hey, let's strive for doing that. Right now, I, I don't want to strive for Mad Max or some kind of a dystopian <laughs> that's future. The, 
that's you've hit the nail on the head. I think that, you know a lot of people ask me why Star Trek was popular for so many years, and I think that was I said it in the book. I think and that was one yeah. of the, precisely one of the reasons. It was the first science fiction series that really presented a hopeful view of the future and a future where science actually made the future better. Uh, and 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 I think that that's a wonderful thing, a wonderful contribution of Star Trek is that is that it showed that that that, that science can make the world a better place and. And the future can be better than the past, rather than most science fiction is a dystopian future that you just discussed. And um, and it would be nice. And I think it's it's nice, but I mean it's also um, we have it's we we can't be naive about it. Science allows that opportunity, but there are many factors in human society that are working in the opposite direction, and we have to try and do whatever we can to try and get to that future, I agree. And one of the, to me, uh, I've often said I'm an educator and the way to do it is to educate. And that's why I try and do it. Um, and, and you know, to the extent I can. And I think ultimately um, asking questions and being open to nature, being open to others, being open to others, uh, to nature itself, being open to nature, being uh, asking questions and listening to the answers is, is, is the way to get there. The last three questions I have for you are for my listeners are basically for those young innovators and entrepreneurs and those people who love science and, and the stars. Um, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Well, I don't know if there's one and I tend to not think in those kind of terms, but the thing I think that's most important is the universe and the cosmos is a remarkable place. It's a wonderful place and it's fascinating without all the nonsense. It's more fascinating without all the nonsense and that, and that we should be open to nature and the world around us and to enjoy the, the brief moment we have in the sun. The fact that we have evolved a consciousness that allows us to ask these questions to appreciate a beautiful sunset or summer day or, 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 and to understand not just what's going on in our world, but to understand what's, what's happening in distant stars and back to the early history of the universe. These are the, the pinnacles of, of human civilization and all of us can appreciate them and, and, and I think use them to help guide, guide us that wonder rather than, than fear, that we should be guided by wonder rather than fear. Maybe that's the best thing I can say. What should young innovators in, in your field, cosmology, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impacts? Well, the point is, I often say, if I knew what the be next big thing was, I'd be doing it. So the yeah. thing about science is, is, you know, discoveries. And so I don't know what'll be the important things in a year or two or three, but certainly, clearly there are areas where we know technology is allowing us to explore. The James Webb Space Telescope is gonna see the first generation of stars. We're just beginning to understand the nature of black holes. Um, there's new tools and techniques to, to, to picture the universe, of huge, huge scale surveys that are, telling us about the distribution of matter and, and then the new and, 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 and puzzles that are coming up in, 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 at accelerators in the elementary structure of matter. Th those are all forefronts where new discoveries may be made. Traditionally, every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised. And so if I were a young person, I'd think about where are the new technologies opening those new windows. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you say, boy, I would have loved to know that from the start? Anything? Um, just that ultimately, um, ultimately, uh, you need to um, not not be discouraged. There are many things that can get you discouraged, and you just have to keep. There will be impediments, and there'll be disasters, and and these two shall pass, and you just have to keep plugging away. That 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 if you keep plugging away, seeds will happen. And and um, and uh, I already knew life was not fair, but life isn't fair. And just recognize it. And um, and I guess the thing I really also probably recognize that took me a long time to realize it is that is that the most interesting ideas and sometimes most interesting and intelligent people in the world are not all in academia. In fact, often outside of academia and to be open to that as well, I think is important. 
Lawrence, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure and an honor for me. I, I really thank you for your time and wish you all the best up in your new home in Canada. It looks beautiful. I, I wish you all, you and your family, all the best. Thank you. And same to you. Thanks a lot for having me. It was kind of fun. Thank you. Thank you.